you see this. Number one, and I have skipped a little bit, and you'll notice now, all right? But, but look at number one. I mean, so what we skipped is if you think you can remain the same, you're drifting. That's the fill-in is the drifting. And start something before the recline. That's the call of the Lord. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Start something now before the, before the recline. That's the fill-in. So let's say your spouse did something nice. Now, I'm going to put it because it's not Benita here. It's me. I'm going to put it that she did something nice to me. I mean, say that's fair. All right. But let's flip-flop it with the gender. I mean, it could be for either one of us. So on the, if I'm on the incline, so I don't want to be on the recline, I don't want to be on the decline, I want to be on the incline, that is my goal, okay? So there is a gratitude, there is a gratefulness, there is an appreciation, there is a response that is positive, where your eyes would light up and your pupils would dilate a little bit, because that girl did something nice. Do you hear me? That's what happens when you're in the incline. And for you girls, when your hubby does something nice, it's right now. It's responding to you. Come on. Amen. It, it's being grateful. It, 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 on, the, on the recline, you can see something good that they did. It's just expected. Well, you know what, that's normal. Why should I appreciate that? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're an almond tree. They should be putting out almonds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're slipping into that lazy boy already, girl. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. No. But eventually, where maybe I was grateful for Benita cooking me chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, you guys... I went up last night, there was one cookie left. <laughs> I thought, why is someone not eating it? I took that thing and ate it right away. I, I didn't care if kids fingered it or something. I just, I, I love cookies. And if you like cookies, uh, yeah. does my belly show that I like cookies? Yeah. <laughs> you said it does. You're yeah. supposed to say no. <laughs> So now you can't see my belly. You know, I, I hope you don't go to a church or don't ever ask me to speak if I have to tuck my shirt in at your church. Because it's like saran wrap in my shirt. I mean, who wants to see that? You understand? So I'm like loose in But here's what happens. She's making me good. I'm grateful. Oh, girl, you went to all that effort. This is Eli. Come on. Yes. This is how life is. Yes. Oh, girl, you went to all that effort to make me cookies. What a sweetheart. But then, if she's making them regularly, well, she's a woman. She made me cookies. I'm a nice guy. She made me cookies. But I've seen people get stinking about it. Where's my cookies? <laughs> Demanding. As if it's her job to make me cookies. <clears throat> Can I tell you something? I ask you a question. Can I tell you something? Yes, funny? yes, yes. I'm with last, last Christmas. I had a brother that had emergency surgery on Christmas Eve about 350 miles away. So I got home late on Christmas Eve. And we make cookies for our neighbors. By the way, we live in a primarily Muslim neighborhood in Modesto. And those people love us. They actually invite us in their home. Two of them have already gotten saved. You know, they, uh, and they even told me, you're the first non-Middle Eastern people we've ever invited in our home in seven years. I'm honored in that name. And they don't do it on what you think of me. They do it on what they think of me as a neighbor. Because I love them. I make them strawberry jam. And my wife hates to see me bring a lug of 
strawberries home. Because she knows the next question is, would you help me with the strawberries? <laughs> oh, Robbie, you always bring work home. You know? Yeah, it's pretty much me, but I'm a foodie. So, <clears throat> she made cookies, and I got home in the evening, right before Christmas. She said, would you help me while they're still up? Let's walk these cookies over to the neighbors. I said, sure. She said, I know I haven't made cookies in a while. She said, I made those two dozen. See that plate over there? That's for us. Oh, sweetie. Oh, by the way, I love her. I do appreciate her. But she's all kid in front of you. And if you saw her face, you'd see. I really do treat her well, as much as I'll tease you. But there have been a few times. So Christmas Eve progressed, and we're going to have our family over the next day, so we're doing some get ready kind of stuff late into the evening. She gets up Christmas morning before the family comes over, and she said, where did you put the plate of cookies? Uh, what cookies? <laughs> she said, do you remember I told you I made those two dozen for us? Yes. Where did you put the plate? In the dishwasher. <laughs> I said, honey, I ate every one of them. <laughs> and we better go to the second one. <laughs> look, look at this. Emotional investment. I want to suggest that your spouse would really like to see a little passion in you. Who said that? Oh yeah, that's a good word. That's healthy, by the way. Now, let me tell you what I mean by passion, because we all come from different personalities and different cultures. By the way, personality I understand, culture I don't. If the Lord wants us passionate and responsive, we need to be passionate and responsive. You happen to agree. <laughs> if you don't, you're about to disagree with God's Word. Look at this. I'm going to read just a small portion of Song of Solomon. And by the way, for those of you that would say, I think that's inappropriate that you would read God's Word on something sexual in front of people. Listen, get over yourself. It's right here for good reason. Come on. It was put in our canon to be a part of it, to not only re represent Christ in the church, but to let every husband know how he ought to be thinking about his wife and let every wife know how she ought to be thinking about her husband and let everybody know what they ought to be thinking about their own body when they're getting together. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Let's see if we can get something out of it. I'm reading Song of Solomon. By the way, if you don't know where to find it, it's right after Proverbs. Listen to this. I'm only reading a couple of verses. If I read any more, some of you'd wish you had your hotel room still. <laughs> it says, Behold. Who said what? Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you fair. You have dove's eyes. How do you like that? Yeah. Huh? You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. By the way, I was trying to imagine. What's that? Chapter 4, the Song of Solomon. You should have this memorized by now. <laughs> and John, it's getting warm in here. Would you go ahead? stay awake for the good part. <laughs> By the way, I was trying to think if I went up to Benita and I was being romantic and sweet, responsive and passionate, that kind of thing towards her. Can you imagine me feeling her hair, saying, honey, your hair is just like goat hair. <laughs> be very nice. Now I'll let you know the truth of this scripture. Hear me, I shouldn't have said that. But it didn't say your hair is like goat hair. 
it said, your hair is like a flock of goats coming down from Mount Gilead. So it really is talking about the beauty of someone that saw the wealth of the shimmer of the goats coming down all together, right against one another, coming down off the mountain. Okay. But I still find humor in it. You understand? And it goes on and says this. <clears throat> Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing. Do you know what that means? She brushed her teeth this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what it means? Hey, look at that girl. She's got great teeth. <laughs> that bit bread stuck in between it. You haven't appreciated your wife keeping her teeth clean lately, unless you said that. It said, every one of them which bears twins. You know, there's one over here. What do you know? There's one over there that matches it. Come on, did you know that? There's none bearing among them. That means she didn't have a bunch of missing teeth. <laughs> to him, not here and there, it's better, your lips are like a strand of scarlet, Kamel are you taking notes on this, <laughs> your mouth is lovely, your temples behind the veil are like a piece of pomegranate. I don't really know how that relates, but they liked pomegranates, so do I. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory, on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. I'm not sure that's as romantic as some of the other. I think it's nicer to say your lips are as like scarlet, but if I told Benita, you remember that military installation we visited last week? I saw all those tanks and armory. Your neck kind of reminds me. <laughs> She'd say, go back to school. And say, it's not better to say, you're two brass. We better stop this pastor. <laughs> are like two fawns, twins of the gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Apparently, he was thinking about food at the same time. <laughs> Proverbs, may her breast satisfy me at all times. This is in the scripture, by the way. For those that have been sometimes sexually violated, you have trouble with this. I'm not trying to violate you. I'm trying to say that there's something beautiful and pure the Lord wants to return to you. You understand? Yes. You know, when so many have been molested, even raped, things of that nature, we can have a new day in the Lord. Let your body, even right now, as we just address the word, let God restore you to purity. And some of us have had bad cultural teaching. That family teacher, where they want to treat you like, well, you don't want to be naked in front of your wife, or naked in front of your husband. Oh no, these folks were naked in front of one another. They actually stuck it in the Bible. Come on, yeah. it wasn't by accident. Now I might tease you a little bit about, you know, your neck built for an armory and on which hangs a thousand bucklers or whatever. But I'll tell you what I see in this. I see a guy on the incline. I see a guy who took the time to speak something positive and trying to relate something very good to her. I tried one time because I like cars. Any of you like cars? I asked you this the other night. Years ago, I had a Porsche 911 Carrera. It was fun. And I used to 
I never, because pastors aren't supposed to have nice cars. <laughs> and I had a very wealthy brother, he's still very wealthy, and he went through some part of thing in his life where he was just tied to this materialism. And he literally had about $150,000 in two cars sitting in the garage walking. He hadn't even opened the garage in three years. He bought a Toyota to try and appear normal. I said, let me help you out. <laughs> he had that portion there rotting away. I said, don't you let that car rot away. Sell it to me. He said, what do you, what do you have to pay for it? I said, I don't have much. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll sell it to you for whatever you want to give me for it. So he actually wrote the bill of sale. I, Norm Booth, sold my brother, Robert Booth, my Porsche 911 for the stolen price of <laughs> I liked that car. And my wife liked it because it always meant we were going out for coffee or going out for a drive. Until someday we wanted to buy a house, then we sold it and got equity out of it. You understand? She didn't like, it was a target, and she didn't like the top off above 100 miles an hour. It tended to bother her. And that car was just getting started at about 100. You know, it's just starting to run right. But I told her one day, honey, your hips are so exciting to me. They're more beautiful than the curve of the 911. <laughs> How'd I do? about the corniest I've ever heard. <laughs> but she liked it because she knew I was trying something. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? She knew I was trying. Mm -hmm. Man, you don't realize I'm telling you some of the best stuff I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Start appreciating your wife verbally again. Women, say something good to your man. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? The world beats us down. We need, we need to build one another up. And that includes telling him something nice. My wife, we know one another well, don't we? That I can talk personally. My wife said, you're such a handsome guy. I was kicked out of the shower. I know what I look like. I saw myself. <laughs> and, uh, one day I said, I said, I think I'm about three months pregnant. <laughs> she said, not three. Wasn't that cruel? <laughs> Write her a letter. BK Booth 777. <laughs> Emotional investment. I want to be passionate. Because you can go through life. Come on. Yawn. 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 It's supposed to say yawn. You know, it's when you're yawning, you're bored, you're not there. They aren't either. And then, here's the Christian word for not being there. Someday. 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 I just withhold. I just withhold. I withhold myself from you. But I use good language. Someday, tomorrow, tomorrow will be lovely. Uh, tomorrow, stop it. Needs to happen today. Yeah. Do you hear me? As an elder in the body of Christ, I declare over you, it needs to happen today. Start loving. Start verbing your spouse. Say, come here, baby. I want to verb you a little bit. With a little action to Men serving one another. How about number three? And love wins. In fact, I want to suggest that we return to a heart that just loves to respond, that loves to please. Do you know in when you look at scriptures like Psalms 37, verse 4? Delight yourself in the Lord. And what will He do? He'll give you the desires of your heart. You know what that is? That's the language of love between us and God. 
Do you still have a language between you and your spouse? That you take delight in them? That you like to you like to please them? Huh? You know, it's kind of sick. But since my wife's been here, I like telling sick stories on myself, telling you the truth about me. My wife works so hard, she keeps the house clean. And I'm not the best house cleaner. I think I'm doing good if I pick up my own shoes. <coughs> I think that's cleaning the house. It's not. It's barely picking up after myself. You know what I noticed I did this last year? This is sick. Do you mind me telling you that this kind of stuff? Okay, she cleans the bathrooms and does the bedding and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, I'll make the bed, but she doesn't like the way I make it. I think you, I will not make the bed how she makes it. She has no exaggeration, 11,000 pillows on top of that bed. Dude, my grandkids sometimes, when grandma's not around, they'll just ask permission. Can I just die for those pillows? Have at it, have at it. Have at it. <laughs> they get lost. We find them a couple days later. <laughs> I told her one day, for the love of God, woman, I can't even lay down on that bed and take a nap. Any <laughs> <laughs> of you understand what I mean? You know, that girl can make things look pretty. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she can make it look pretty, and she makes a home a home. Yeah. That's right. Me, I think making a bed's pulling up the covers to keep the dust off the pillow. All right. <laughs> How many are with me on that? And, and I'm a little, I'm a little too self-centered still. But I do work hard. You understand? She works hard too. But I'll clean the counter, and I do this almost every time we're home. Probably once a week, I'll clean the counter and the sinks, clean the toilet. You know what I do right after I do that? I go in and tell her. Hey, look at what I did. She be saying that constantly. <laughs> Love to please. Love to please. John 14, verse 14. Jesus says this. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father be glorified in the Son. It's the language of love. Just like delighting ourselves in the Lord is. But we can become pretty complacent. I'm going to use a, another word. Pretty one way. And it can get worse. Eventually, you can kind of knock the please out of your spouse. You can actually train them to not want to be pleasing to you by how we respond to them. Do you understand? Yes. Because they can get to the point where they are actually resistant to wanting to please you. I guarantee you, in a group this size, that there are some of you that I've asked you to raise your hand and say, have you ever not done something so you purposely would not please your spouse? Because you were irritated with them. There'd be a couple of hands that would go up. In fact, I just saw three go up anyway. <laughs> All right, how many of you have ever done that? Yeah. yeah. And so, let's go back. Let's, let's do what, let's get on the incline. Let's plant the almond tree again. Come on. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. And by the way, it makes it easier if both of you jump on the same train together. Mm. Decide to love, mm. verb, mm. and in here, uh, serving one another. How about building relationship? This is a good one. Have you been enjoying this so far? Yes. <laughs> All the women said yes. <laughs> so let me just say this. Be a seeker of your spouse. What does the Lord say in Matthew 6, 33? What's the first word? Seek. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. We're, we're born and created. I should say we're created and born to be seekers. Our spouse likes being sought after too. Do you hear me? Hey honey, where are you at? That's sure a lot different than you don't even notice them when they're in the same house. <laughs> Does it notice? I had one wife tell me my husband loves football so much if I stood in front of the television set naked while he's watching TV, while he's watching sports, he wouldn't notice that something's truly wrong with that man. If that's true. There are other people that the seat's been knocked out of. They avoid. Let me give you a quick story. And would someone give me a glass of water? This from back there, Mike. Thank you. I could speak for hours and hours and hours if you give me one more glass of water. Who wants to trip you? No, anyway. Listen to this. I come home. By the way, this is as ugly as I get. All right. Do you mind me telling you this? Uh, is this okay? Yeah. Hard working man directing two counseling centers at the same time. Thank you. You're so nice. Yeah, it is. It is. And hopefully a little bit here. I come home from work. And I get to the door, and I don't know what your image of how a wife would be, husbands, but my image was always maybe I got it from TV or something. <laughs> you know, there was a there was a TV program in the states called Leave It to Beaver, and Mom and Dad Ward and June. You got that? Key players Ward and June. You could you could watch it on YouTube. You ever want to see it? And Ward would come home with his little briefcase, and there's June, and she had her little apron on. She'd been cooking. House all perfect, kids all perfect. And, you know, Ward walks in, no joke, June Cleaver, she just takes that briefcase out of his hand, greets him. And so that was my image that I'd come in the house, that he'd come over and take it. This is sick. This is sick. She take my briefcase out of my hand. Say, oh, honey, if you had an okay day, oh, I worked really hard. Pat me on the back. Tell me how appreciative she is of me. I walked in the door. <laughs> hey, you around? Nothing. 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 Now maybe she fell during the day, conked her head, and bled out or something. <laughs> I don't know what happened. So it was a little house. We couldn't afford much. So I looked to the right, checked out the bedrooms. You could see all three of them from one vantage point. <laughs> then went to the other end, which wasn't far, into the kitchen. There she was. Miracle of miracles, she was cooking. Trying to boil some spaghetti noodles. Standing there by that hot fire while it was trying to boil the water. Just as cold as could be. Just a cold old woman. How many of you know what I'm talking about? No, don't. No. Just cold. Just cold. I thought I could tell her why the water hasn't boiled yet. <laughs> She's standing too close to it. <laughs> So I said, by the way, I tell you this story with her permission. So I, I said, hey, she said, hi. <laughs> really? I went to our bedroom, had some dress clothes on, pulled them off. I like wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I was changing while I was pulling my shoes off. I was praying. God do something with that cold old woman. 
murmur heart. I just thought, no one deserves coldness like that. Every man deserves a woman being warm and responsive. A little passionate. A little hungry for us. How I many of you are with me so far? <laughs> Carmel started to raise his hand, just decided to brush his hand. He, he thought I was I think I beat it up with you. <laughs> so I got it. I was going to pray what I told you. But I got about as far as, Lord, I wish you'd do something with it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I hope you have. But the Lord, in a millisecond, like running a CD player, a video, he showed me how I'd been treating her the last two months. Whoa. I saw that I'd been coming home in my selfish, self-centered, wanting to be pat on the back way acting like she had nothing to do but to greet me and acting like she didn't work all she did was watch a couple kids all day <laughs> and I saw the error of my ways I mean that's his girl so I repented to the Lord I mean if you would have to come on Jesus and you know what is it's, of course it's also turning in other words I'm not going to do that anymore uh, you know what I'm saying you can agree with me it's okay. you know, just, you know, and, but it's also God forgive me forgive me how I can be so selfish so self centered and then I heard him say now you go apologize to Benita and I said Lord why if I went to God of this human and you have forgiven me. Would I need to go to a very more time person? <laughs> he said, because you offended her. So I went in. By the way, I had this time in the Lord. She didn't. Did you catch that? Yes. Yes. So I walked in. And she's still trying to get that water. To go. <laughs> I wanted to give her a little insight on cooking <laughs> I said, hey, Benita, I'm sorry. You know what she said? For what? That's what we used to say to our kids, because when we'd catch them and they'd say they're sorry, what are they sorry for? That they got caught or that I'm alive? <laughs> she said, what are you sorry for? I said, I've been treating you wrongly the last couple months. Just I've been self-centered. I'm sorry. I've been this. I've been that. I really did. And by the way, it didn't exactly make her a hot potato. You understand? <laughs> because it took me a couple months to get her in that mood. Because she's stable. Yeah. You know? So it took a lot of pop pound in my, in my life and my self-centeredness to get her into that mood. Mm -hmm. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 This is better than you know. <laughs> He's wanting us to live on the incline. So as I left that room, I decided if it took me two months to put her in that mood, even though I'd expect just because I, the heavens opened up and Robbie said he was sorry, and I expected her to respond immediately, maybe I need to give her a couple months of good living to warm her heart up. Are you hearing me? Yes. So I gave myself over. When I'd come in that door, I'd be a seeker. See, I'd trained her to want to almost avoid me mm -hmm. on how selfish I had been. Do you understand that? Yes. But I was going to be retrained, and I've kept that incline, by the way. Yes. I'm a seeker. I'm going to seek that girl out. I'm going to tell her I've missed her that day. I even lied to her. She likes it. 
<laughs> St. Benita, I was in the middle of that trauma counseling, could barely pay attention. I was thinking about it so much. He <laughs> said, so say, I'll stop it. Now do it some more. <laughs> Sometimes I'll send her a text from the same house. I counsel the same place we live. It is a 9,400 square foot house. Sometimes I don't have the foggiest on where she is. And God knows it would be exercised just to go find her. Come on. But I thought, well, it might take two months. I'd come in the door. Where are you at, girl? I've been waiting to lay my eyes right on you. Oh, oh, oh. We're going to throw a party. Come on. You forgot to. Maybe you never have. And you need to get started. Read the Song of Solomon. There's a party being thrown right there. Come on. I'm coming to get some of your cultures. I'm coming to get some of your family ways. It's God coming against you. Saying, come on, conform to this way. This is good stuff. Come on. I thought it'd take her two months to respond. Within five days. Carmel, I want you to hear this. Within five days, she was meeting me at the door. Unfortunately, still with clothes on, but she's me. <laughs> oh, just saying. Just saying. How about this next one? Are you enjoying this? Yes. This, this next one. We're, we're talking about seeking Jesus together. There is a man in the United States by the name of Dr. James Dobson. Maybe you've heard of him. Yes. Head of a ministry called Focus on the Family. Yes. I've met personally with, spent time with H.P. London, his brother-in-law, wonderful guy, head of the Pastor to Pastors ministry there with Focus on the Family. They did a survey because in America, the divorce rate fluctuates between about 48 and 52 percent it has for two decades <clears throat> and the reason that sometimes it's not higher is that people sometimes aren't getting married in other words they're living together but by the way infidelity amongst couples living together is twice as high as it is among people that made covenant together and that's so and yet some of them are trying to live in that kind of relationship because they think they're safer. It's not safer. It's more dangerous. Anyway, you want to hear this stuff? Yes. Okay. So, they did a study and found that, and by the way, in our military in the United States, divorce rate has been as high as 83%. 83%. I was one of 14, a group of 14 that met with the generals at the Pentagon to get the deployments changed from 18 months to 12 months again because they were ruining families. And I've done a bunch of this kind of very couple conference on military bases. And after spending three days with me, I guess I'll wear them out, but they'll be 80% of them unsaved and they'll all get saved. And that name is Jesus revealing himself to him. And so you pray for me. But here's what Dr. Dobson found. A family that prays, a couple that prays with one another. Um, and I can't presume just because you're pastors, you pray with your spouse. But if you pray together, and you go to church together, divorce rate drops to just under 4% from roughly 51%. 51% down to 4.8% is what it is statistically. Now I think there's a lot of reason for it. And then as I'm one of those guys, are you getting the goods out of this, you guys? Are you enjoying this, John? Yeah, thank you. He's enjoying Jill is what he's enjoying. Yeah. You know what he just said? He said, your neck is gorgeous. <laughs> Come on, say that to her right now. Come on, John. No, we want you to 
house over here, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Have any of you ever gotten a fight on the way to church? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, have you ever been in the middle of worship? Have you ever, listen to me. Have you ever been in the middle of worship and you thought, I've got to tell her I'm sorry. So, you, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I've actually interrupted Benita's worship because we get in some sort of thing on the way to church. It was always her fault. <laughs> Yes, I'm kidding. Anyway, and I and I say tap her on the shoulder because honestly, every time I try to worship the Lord, the Lord would say, "Come on, she's my girl. Make things right with her." To be used of God, to sing, to speak, to pray, Robbie. <laughs> Someone the way, Robbie. My love so much to feel the touch of his consuming fire, Robbie. Come on. To be used of God, it's my desire. You want that to happen? Make things right with your yeah. sins. Amen. Amen. Whoa. Benita, yeah, babe. I'm sorry. I know y'all. You forgive me. Get back to worship. <laughs> now I can. Now you can. Yeah. can lift my pure, holy hands to the Lord right. with my that's heart right. that's living. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, this is sick. But you can tune that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. With the Lord, you no longer hear the Lord say, hey. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Romans 1 is a good picture of it. Well, it's a terrible picture of it. Where a person sears their conscience. Do I believe you can sear a nerve of just getting used to mediocre between you and your spouse, you can, but it is not God's will. Listen to the voice of your father. Listen to the voice of your dad in heaven. Amen. So, when a family, when a family prays, and by the way, I don't mean to have to have a prayer meeting. I don't mean to sound sick and like I don't pray. How many of you know I really do pray? I mean, I've been on my knees this morning already, interceding for you as well as me. Oh, God, give me a voice. <laughs> you know, but I want more than a voice. You understand? Interceding for you. But I want to tell you, there's times I'm in a hurry. And if prayer meant take 15 minutes with your wife right now, see ya. No, I want to at least touch base with you. But need I bless your day in Jesus' name. Lord, pray for me, honey. By the way, she prays for me all the time. I know I'm covered in prayer. That girl can pray. And she loves me and she prays for me. You understand? She knows we don't rely on our own strength, our own brilliance, our own giftedness, etc. It's nothing to the Lord. But we need God to move. Amen. So be sensitive to the person's time restraints when you're praying. Amen. And don't preach to him when you pray. Oh God, open his eyes to you. <laughs> I heard a missionary praying earlier. Go to church. Seek the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Not just because we're pastors, this stuff works. Because otherwise, you see people, they have a hit and miss ritual. You know, and, and that's what God has become to them religion. Ritual. Well, I got to be spiritual a little bit, you know, so I'll go when there's no sports. You know, listen, I don't want to be hit and miss with the Lord. I'm a pilot, by the way. 
would you ever want to go fly with me if I said, by the way, this motor runs pretty good most of the time. A little hit and miss, but we'll be all right in the pits. Uh, uh, uh. I like that thing purring. In fact, I cannot think I'm not even paying attention while I'm flying. Maybe we're busy talking. And boy, I can feel that something starts to run different. <laughs> and I catch off immediately. You won't even notice it. And I can notice what's going on. Me and another pastor, we're flying over some mountains at a couple hundred miles an hour headed to a pastor's meeting. And he was pilot in command that day. We were in a high-performance aircraft. We enjoyed ourselves. But we were intensely talking. I said, well, what's going on with that problem with your church council? So we were talking. <laughs> we didn't notice the gauge was on empty and hadn't switched tanks yet. I guarantee you, in the middle of that conversation, where that engine started to start for fuel, that boy's hands moved so quickly to switch the other tank on and hit the electric fuel pump. On we went without incident. Huh? And I'm here to tell about it. But listen, I don't like hitting this. I don't like that kind of stuff. Because you keep putting up with that kind of thing. You're going to get stuck someday. You hear me? I want to be a seeker consistently. Because I want God to consistently move in my life. Amen? And then it can get worse. I'm just too busy. Well, your life shows it. Let's go on. Let's go on to the next one. I think you'll enjoy it even more. How about problem resolution? Do you know there's just some people in this room, you have a let's grow attitude. How, how many of you just, you want to do everything it takes to grow and be right? Raise your hand. Well, all right, there's a bunch of you half pastors, all right? But let's grow. You know, it's the, it's the Ephesians chapter number four, you know, it's the, it's the verse 32, be kind. Hear me, let me say that again. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. That's what, what it says there. In that same chapter, it also says in verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Huh? Now, how many of you believe that should be taken literally? That is, don't keep sleeping on it. Or, you know, don't, don't keep letting the sun go down. I did a married couples conference in the Yukon. If you don't know where the Yukon is, I'm not surprised. It's like the Antarctic or Arctic or something. I mean, it's above Canada, next to Alaska up in the Yukon. I was doing a married couples conference for the whole Christian community of St. Fort St. Uh, St. John. And the interesting part about it is I woke up in the middle of the night because I needed to use the bathroom. And I remember the sun was still out. I woke Benita up the next morning. I said, I like this place. She said, oh, it's nice. It's pretty. Again. Yeah, but I realized that if I didn't feel like restoring things with you, I could go on for days <laughs> and never let the sun go down on my back. But in the winter, I better hurry. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. No, you know what it means. Yeah. Don't, don't keep avoiding it. Your, here's what happens. <clears throat> Your heart will go from loving, and it'll begin to get a little crusty. It'll get a little protective. It'll turn a little bitter. You leave bitterness sit around. You keep disobeying the Lord. You keep doing what you're doing again and again, and it becomes a little resentful. You keep letting resentment sit around and acting off your resentment rather than the beautiful spring of the love of God. You're going to get hateful. It just keeps worsening. It won't get better until you decide, I want to grow. And so there's other people that say, no, I can, I can just sleep on it. Why, when the Lord says one way, would you believe that you know better 
Now I know some of you say, well, you know what, I've never seen resolve work well. Well, learn to make it. Where you actually have a goal. I'm going to love you more through this conversation than I ever have before. That's my number one goal in the talk. I'm going to find a resolution and it's not going to be defending myself. I'm going to find a resolution and it's not going to be about me being right. But we're going to learn to listen and care. Come on, how do you say that's good stuff? It is good stuff. Okay. Because otherwise, people want to, when you keep accumulating, these people accumulate. So they just want you to go. Get out of my presence. I, I kid you not. I knew a woman. Of course, you run across all kinds. This lady, her and her husband came in for counseling. And she had a big old Bible. Big like Nigel's. Hold, hold your Bible up. So Can I hold your Bible? I mean, you'll have to decoody it after I'm done. But she had a big old Bible like this. And, and I asked him what the problem was. He said, I don't know. I don't have a clue. And by the way, I believe he didn't have a clue. <clears throat> She opens her Bible, and she had a big old cover. Do any of you have a cover around yours? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you have a cover around yours. Look at that. Yeah. Do any of you have a big Bible and a Bible cover? Yeah. Let me see it. Just show oh, it to us. Oh, he's got the cover. Oh, you have the cover too, Nigel. Look, she does too. Does yours have anything on the front? No, on the front. Oh, no, the cover. No, no, no. Take it off. Yeah. Well, this lady came in. Hers had a big Holy Spirit dove right there. This Holy Spirit dove. I was so impressed. I thought, what a godly woman. Holy Spirit dove right there, just kind of descending with the, with the dove right into your heart. All right. So I asked her, I said, what, what's going on with the two of you? She said, I'm glad you asked. She, she picks her Bible up. Sit, sit, sit. Dude, this woman is scared me. She scared me. So I thought, she opens it up just like this. And you don't know, think of how many, you know, we're all pastors, all right? Think how many hours we spent in the Word. I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 that I spent in the Word. I love God's Word. It's it's the foundation of my life. How about you from here? And she's going through it, and we don't realize we try and guess where a person's going. Yes, yes. And I thought, okay, Old Testament. No, she's heading to the new. I bet she's going to Ephesians. No, she passed it up. I, I bet she's going to Revelation. When she gonna get out of Revelation? No, she's going to the concordance. No, she passed it up. She passed it up. Then, then I thought, I'm looking for a Nigel in your Bible. She, I saw some maps. And she's going to the maps. In the back. I thought, she, what is she getting out of marriage? For the maps. No, she went past the map. Oh, look, and then there's these pages. Look at these. Nigel, yours are empty. That's because it's all written on your heart, huh, buddy? I like that. He's in jail. Hers were not empty. She had this big old long bony finger, had a little curve in it. She pointed like that. I kid you not. This is the way I remember it. She said, our problems started on our wedding night. Oh. I thought, oh dear God, what are we in for? Oh. She said, all I ever wanted was to be carried over the threshold oh. on our wedding night. It was big old bony finger. She's pointed a specific bullet point. Wow. All I ever wanted carried over the threshold of my wedding night. Of course, I'm thinking, dude, <laughs> that's all she ever dreamed about since she was a little girl, 
flip her up over her shoulder, <laughs> carry her on in, flop her on the bed. Enjoy your wedding night. Come on, have your yeah. wedding night. Yeah. That's what makes the girl happy. If that's her childlike dream, fulfill her dream, it's free. I thought, she said, that's all I ever wanted. And he didn't fulfill my dream. Aww. Isn't that true? Just feel bad for her. I thought, what a low life man he is to not fulfill her dream of carrying her over the threshold of that motel room of Motel 6 and then left the light on for her. He looked at me. He said, Pastor, there's another story to this. Oh, oh really? Because I'm thinking he's kind of a slide ball, poor yeah. cow. I mean, it's her lifelong dream. Since a little girl, yeah. get her in the room, up and over the threshold. Yeah. All she has to do is just kind of do a bear hug. Yeah. Kind of, what does it take to get her over? How does she want to be carried? Do the carrying of the woman, all right? How many of you agree with him? He said, there's another story to this. He said, we had a, what do they call it, a bachelor party. He said it was two days before the wedding. And he said it was all her brothers and uncles and her dad. And then my family, my brothers and my brother-in-laws and my dad. And he said, and we all decided to go out and play football. He said, what I didn't know is it was supposed to be touch. But they all decided, without my knowledge, to make it tackle football. Okay. And they constantly threw the ball at me. Oh. So they would tackle me. Mm. He said it was kind of funny at first. We all kind of laughed. But he said, I know it was the third or fifth time they tackled and they all dog ball. Oh. He said, I broke my arm in three places. Oh. He said, busted my collarbone. I was having surgery. They put, I had pins and titanium rods coming out. He said, Pastor, I could barely make it. I, I couldn't make my practice because I was just getting out of the hospital the night before. He said, I was on such strong narcotics. I thought, I'm upset in my stomach. I'm sick. I'm in incredible pain. How will I ever even make it to my wedding? But he said, I did. They wheeled me up in a wheelchair. Oh. He said, so I stood there and you know, I tried standing during the time of the making covenant and stuff. And he said, they were holding me, you know, that kind of thing. I do. I do. Anyway, he said, Pastor, I can barely remember our wedding night. He said, but also I want to go to bed. But he said, I can barely hold myself, let alone carry her over the threshold. Yes, yeah. Now I gotta tell you, my sweet counselor at the time, I flipped from <laughs> that bad man to I'm thinking, how dare she hold that against him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, just listen, maybe she has a couple more things to say. So she opens, she still got her bony finger there. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any circulation going in the <laughs> Just kind of curved over there, just like yeah. that. Too. And she she starts this list of all the wrongs that she's recorded of him. She I call her the tabulator. Did you catch that? The tabulator. You're like you have a tab. She just tabulates everything like an accountant does with numbers. And every time she look at it, I remember what you did wrong. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I wonder something. Do you mind if I wonder? Then I'm going to give you a quick potty break. But did, in, in, in Ephesians chapter number five, there's some powerful scriptures on marriage there. You know that, you know, it starts off with verse number 18 where it says, Submit therefore what to another. How many of you know that? It's where it stops. Okay. Do you know that word submission means be subject to? You know, God bless you. You're being subject to me right now. All right. 
and there might have been a couple that said, I'm not subjecting myself to him anymore, I'm out of here. And they left or something, I'm not aware of who, but point them out. I'd like to know who I'm teasing. But no, you're subjecting yourself to me. When I listen to you and listen to your story, I'm subjecting myself to you. You know, when there's tension between two people, sometimes there's a tendency to say, I will not subject myself to you any longer. I won't listen to you. I won't be touched by you. I won't be influenced by you. I, I will devalue you. I will not be subject to you. Then Paul says a little further, he says, wives, are you listening? Yes. See to it that you subject yourself to your husband. And, and by the way, I don't know, but I have to wonder this because I study human behavior. And it's interesting to me. Is it possible women are a little different than men? More than just plumbing? Yeah. It is. And is it possible that women, maybe right before a man would, would come to the point of almost extermination, where they would say, I'm not going to be subject to him anymore. I'm done. And yet the word of the Lord would be, come on, come on, be subject. Okay. Then, then three times, as if I didn't hear it the first time, it says, husband loves your wives. It's Christ loved the church. Really, Jesus, you want me to love her that much? Yeah. And I wonder if there's a tendency. Why, why, does, why does the word repeat itself to you, sir, and to me three times over? Is there a tendency in a man that if we don't believe we're being treated in the way we'd like to grow accustomed, that we start not loving? And so the word of the Lord is, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Come on. Amen. That's good stuff. Yeah. So right in the middle of the end of it, is there such a thing in the middle of the end? I was enjoying that. Thank you. Paul says this. Why well, see to it that you respect your husbands? You know, I don't mean to translate or be a commentary on what everything means on it, except to say this. If you look at your man with eyes that tabulate everything he's ever done wrong, it makes it very hard for him to grow. Yeah. Even though if I gave you truth sermon, you'd say, oh, I thought I was being helpful by remembering all those things. <laughs> oh, no. He can see it in your eyes. But there's no way to win with you. So Paul puts the reset by saying those words, see to it that you respect your husband. He wasn't trying to garner respect for somebody that's living an unrespectable life. He's trying to reset the marriage by speaking the word of God that we know is the word of God today. Amen? Amen. So how many of you, would you let your heart be reset today by God himself? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Where you would look at your spouse and no longer look at him with, I remember what you did starting our wedding night. You know? I, no. Baby, you can win in me. I don't, I don't keep a record of wrongs. Come on. How many of you are with me on that? Raise your hand high. Yeah. 